All right. Well, um, welcome to another PSL Demo Day. We're really excited here to have Don Boyd with us today. Don is a Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Policy Research at Rockefeller College. Uh, he's also a contributor to a number of PSL projects, Tax Data, Tax Calculator, and uh, the PUP State Distribution Project on which he'll be speaking today. So he's gonna talk to us about how to create tax data for the 50 states. Don, please. All right, um, well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm gonna start by trying to share my screen. If it doesn't work, uh, let me know. I will try to get to the right place, which is a bunch of slides. Uh, I assume at this point, everybody sees my uh, Google Chrome with uh, uh, slides. Um, we did, not? we did. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start, start presenting. Um, let me start with the, uh, so the title says it, uh, Constructing 50 State Weights for the PUF, the public use file, that's sum to national weights. And um, the motivation, uh, the, or at least the primary motivation, is to be able to analyze the impact of federal tax reforms by state. This is a graph from some earlier work that Matt and I did late uh, Matt Jensen and I did late last year, which kind of gives you a flavor of the kinds of things you might want to do. This is the TCJA tax cut um, valued uh, in 2018, comparing that law to um, the 2017 law, the prior law. And if you're high on the graph, it means that your tax cut was high uh, 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 relative to, was high as a percent of your um, uh, prior law liability uh, and uh, New York was a state of interest in the US so they're both kind of highlighted and you can see Texas and Arkansas were for the lowest income range I'll just use the cursor so you can kind of see what I'm talking about had 20 percent plus tax cuts uh, New York Connecticut New Jersey we just looked at a, a set of I think nine states um, or ten in total uh, were low and you go across and you're probably not too surprised that the typical tax cut is a little bit smaller. Uh, and you see way down in the highest AGI range, a million or more, you know, uh, New Yorkers, Connecticut, and California actually had tax increases because they're below this line. So anyway, you know, the point is to be able to do this kind of thing, and, and you know, this is just one visualization, but be able to do this kind of analysis for all of the states and for many kinds of tax reforms. And so that's what this project is about. The goals are to construct state weights for a tax calculator ready public use file, meaning one that can be run through that amazing project of the policy simulation library, which is tax calculator and compute federal taxes under any, you know, almost any different uh, policy scenario. And to do two things, the weighted summaries by state, we'd like to be consistent with published or forecasted state data for the state. That is, you know, basic facts like numbers of taxpayers by income range, uh, AGI by income range, and so on. And furthermore, the second goal is that the state weights on each record will sum to the record's national weight. <coughs> uh, that has the nice quality of ensuring that if you add up the states, uh, and the policy conclusions for the states, they um, add to the nation. The, um, um, the, uh, uh, this talk is gonna be heavy on reproducibility, so it's gonna get kind of technical. Um, uh, I'm gonna zoom through the first uh, uh, steps of the process, which are all very important. You can't do the project without doing those first steps. Uh, so we can focus on what will become step number five, which is the creation of the weights themselves, okay? I am gonna go fast. There's some slides that are just for reference. I'm, I'm just gonna try to give the gist of them and not go through all the details of everything. I'd suggest holding questions to the end, except those that might be needed to clarify things. So uh, I've got links here for two Python repositories. One is called Waiting, uh, which has a micro weight module uh, with a problem class that does two things. It will reweight a set of file, a, a set of records, kind of like tax calculator does a little bit differently, or tax data, excuse me, a little bit differently, and geo weight, which is the heart of this, which is finding the state weights that meet the requirements. Uh, there's a second, re and it also has a module called make test problems, because you really can't do this without setting up lots of test problems and making sure they work. Uh, puff analysis, um, is the other repo um, 
which has functions that do this specific task. The first one is a more general repo. This one is all about Puff. And um, the program, which really I'll be stepping through today, is called this createstateweights.py. And uh, just to make it a little bit more reproducible, each of these modules has a branch named PSL demo, which is what I'll be using. And I will, uh, any further changes I make will be to a different branch. So that'll be there. Uh, this is not ready for people to just kind of point and click and, and use it. This is, you know, very rough, lots of Deadwood functions, incomplete and out-of-date documentation. Um, so um, in part after talking to Mac, Matt and also after talking to Martin Homer, I mean, it, we, we discussed it made a lot of sense to use 2017 as the year for um, constructing the weights. And the reason for that is there are good SO data from the IRS by state. I've got a link to them called uh, uh, Historical Table 2, uh, HT2 from here on out. Um, and the latest year there is 2018, but the problem with 2018 is that um, uh, everything changed dramatically. We lose lots of detail because, of course, many more people are uh, take the standard deduction. So if you want details on deductions, you really need to go to 2017. That's crucial for the analysis of SALT. Um, and, uh, of course, we'll get to maybe uh, what do you do about later years. Right now, we compute the shares, or I compute the shares for 2017, and those carry forward. Uh, we know that's not perfect. Um, so the main steps are to download and parse IRS summary data for the nation and the state and construct potential targets. Uh, I, I list the programs that do this, but we're not going to go through it. Uh, then there is preliminary preparation of the national data file because I want to make sure it hits various targets that will then be distributed across the states. Then we prepare the state targets. Uh, I do a step that uh, is inspired by the Tax Policy Center, which is to revise national weights to be more consistent with um, uh, state weights, and then the big step, step five, is apportioning each record's national weight to the states. Uh, and then step six, not done here, is to try to do a better job of extrapolating to later years uh, to take into account changes across um, states. Uh, so step one, not going to go through the details. Some of them are listed here. The goal is to obtain IRS data suitable for targets and structure in a computer-friendly and documented manner. Uh, I pull from lots of IRS data files for the nation, one data file for the state. There's all sorts of tedious work aligning variable concepts uh, in the IRS to concepts in the PUF, aligning concepts in the IRS data on historical table two uh, with the concepts, the IRS concepts. Um, these programs have not been used in quite a few months, but they're listed here, the ones that will actually create what I call Targets 2017 Possible, which are, um, those are um, national potential targets and the programs that ultimately compute the each state's share of um, the national historical table to data for each of many variables in each of 10 income ranges. If you were to, to try to reproduce what's in step one, you'd have to rename some, you'd have to download the IRS files, which is done by pr programmatically. You'd have to um, then run the code I've given with, I think, some directory changes. I will get back to uh, updating that, but, but it won't just work with a push of a button. Um, the second step, which we will step through, is preliminary preparation of the national data file. The goal is to end up with a 2017 national file with tax filers only. The reason for that is that the IRS data are the only people they have data on in their in their um, summary data are people who file tax returns. So there's all sorts of people who don't file. Who Anderson goes to great work to construct potential tax records for them, uh, but they're not 
in the IRS data. So if you're targeting something, or at least if you're using the IRS data to target something, you need to make sure you're looking at the puff subset that corresponds to the target data. So that's what this is. This step is about. The other, the another step is to make sure that by the time we get to 2017, the data in the puff for the filers look as much like the IRS national summary data as possible. So that's what this is doing. Uh, the major steps are to advance the puff, calculate to 2017, calculate 2017 law AGI, determine AGI bins for each record, meaning you know what AGR group group are you in, and then determining filer status. Um, I get I get the previously created targets. Um, we create a subset of the puff needed for analysis. Um, we examine how close it, it starts out to the IRS data. We then reweight it to get there. There's basically, um, uh, we end up with about 756 targets. What I target is 43 variables roughly for each of 18 AGI ranges. So it, it works out by the time we're done dropping a few of the 756. The software used to do it is IPOP, which stands for Interior Point Optimizer. It's just a nonlinear uh, constrained optimizer that's you know quite good and quite fast. Um, currently, tax data is using Julia's um, Tulip optimizer, which I think you know realistically, you know one is probably as good as the other. Um, and and then when you're done, just kind of examine the quality, make sure you ended up where you wanted to be. So I probably need to step through this quite quickly to stay on schedule. So let me just, just do that. We're gonna um, do a couple of the steps of it and then, um, uh, um, let's see, I should be able to get rid of that. Uh, maybe not. Um, okay, so this is the program. Uh, we should be able to start at the beginning. I'm just gonna, first of all, I apologize for the garish colors. Uh, I am new to VS Code, which this is. It has the nice feature that anytime you do something like the uh, pound sign with percent percent, you can create essentially a cell, which is a nice thing. And I was looking for some kind of theme that made it easy to pick those out. Anyway, so you know, yeah, we have to import a lot of things that have already imported. Um, Reimports is just a feature. Again, I'm saying this because of the reproducibility, the desire to make it reproducibility. Any module that I might change external to this program or even internal to it, I want to be able to re-import that module, which VS Code doesn't do automatically, so you just re-import it when you change it. Um, define the locations for the couple of input data sources that you need. I ended up creating this one called temporary directory with target source data because those targets, since you you might, you might try and fail to run the uh, target creation data, I've included them in a data directory which should get pushed to GitHub so that it, if you have access to the puff, you should be able to do everything. And we just define various directories. There, and, and, and right now, I am using the puff uh, that I created from Anderson's July, well, well I created on July 2nd um, using uh, uh, the, the version of tax data in effect then, okay? So I don't need to rerun any of those things. Uh, <laughs> the only constant that's actually in here is just a list of quantiles to use for various reporting purposes. And that's it, we start, we begin by advancing the puff and to a later year and saving it. Um, let's see if we, it should all work. Yes, yeah, so it's all saved and done. Uh, so we now have a 2017 puff that's saved as what's called a parquet file. I use them because they're, when I started doing this, um, Python was extremely slow or pandas was extremely slow reading CSV files. They're a little bit faster now, but anyway, so I'm still using that. And then we get from the previously created targets, a set of targets, data, so just to show you what that is, it's just a data frame that if you were to look at it, you would see there are 18 or 19 rows, one for each of 18 IRS income ranges and zero for the total. There's 52 columns, meaning there are 51 variables plus the stub identifier. And you know, if you look, you can see that, um, I don't know how to, I can't quite see, uh, NRET all, 
means the number of returns, 152.9 million. That's simply the IRS number, $1.58 trillion of IRS uh, 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 of um, tax liability in 2017. So that's what we did. We then create a subset of the pub, puff, let's make sure, which is done now. So if you look at that, same kind of thing. Um, we now have only 227,000 rows because I dropped out the non-filers. Of course, we could keep them in and, and drop them later. And then each variable is now going to be one that gets used in various targeting procedures later. Uh, this is AGI as computed for 2017. And you know, uh, it's true or false for the various binary data um, variables. And um, certain NNZ means that a record had a non-zero amount for a certain item. Uh, anyway, these, these are all needed. It makes it easier to target if essentially we're, we're creating, um, um, well, I'll just, we're creating variables that are e easy to, to, to convert to uh, 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 targets or users' targets. The next thing is we examine how close we are starting out to the um, IRS data. We're not going to bother with that. Then we reweight it. I will just show you what we're doing now is we're running through each of the 18 income ranges and trying to come closer to the IRS data. And what we're reporting at the end of each income range is, um, and this really doesn't take very long, so if you just bear with me, we'll be done in a minute with this. Um, so what we've done, it took 23 seconds. Remember the quantiles were the minimum value. This is the percent difference we end up with from the target. So, um, and the quantiles are the zeroth quantile, the minimum. So the worst case in this particular income range is we're off by one tenth of a percent and uh, in, too low. And the worst case in the other direction is off by one tenth of a percent too high. So we already know that we're going to come out that that for all income ranges except for the first where those numbers aren't there, those numbers are much worse. Uh, we're going to be very close to the IRS targets for that. But we will also we had. Um, Let's see, did I do step two? So we're gonna now, the next thing we're gonna do is just create something that actually does a comparison. Again, I wanna get through this quickly, so let's just quickly look, and this will be, so we created this reweighted national, and what it shows you, basically, me, all right, I'm, I'm gonna speed up, but what it shows you is, in case you were to go look at this, and there's, there's pretty good descriptive material. We look at income stub, zero is all income ranges, and meaning it's the total number of returns, and there's usually a description telling you what a variable means, so that's over there, and what the IRS variable name was, or it's a name I gave to it, what the IRS amount or value was, 152,903,000 returns, what happened after we, we reweighted? We came within, well, 0.0%. It's we were off by 20,000 returns. IP diff is what the unadjusted puff was. So it was off by 5.7%. We're off by about zero. And you can kind of quickly go down and you would like all of the percent differences to be very, very small. And by and large, they are, even though they were sometimes larger. And since we landed on taxable interest, that's worth noting. So I prefer this approach to what's being currently done in, in the um, uh, puff, where you can see the initial puff was off by you know close to 30% in the highest income range, and we're now brought back within a tenth of percent. So I think that um, you know, obviously, anytime you push data around like this, you have to worry about unintentional side effects. But this brings for roughly 43 variables, this brings the puff almost um, uh, perfectly in line with what we know from the IRS. And, and my view is that if you're going to forecast out to 2029 or 2030, you'd at least like to start at 2017 or the last data year, being pretty close to um, um, what was reported. 
So then we, I, I, I'm going to have to move quickly here, I think, but we, we just create a list of states that we want to run, st create state targets for, and this is just all of them. You know, in various testing regimes, you might use fewer than all of them. Uh, we run a report that, um, well, we, we create the historical table to targets if you were to run that cell. That's very fast, um, should have been done, yeah. And um, I run a few reports that examine um, kind of the starting point. Uh, the, the goal really is to get a sense of, it, it answers two questions. One is how far are the historical two data from the IRS data? And it says versus PUF, but it really, you know, because the PUF is so close to the IRS, it's it too. And it turns out that, you know, they're not always the same. And so, um, it's important, of course, and that's the re it's important, of course, to get the, um, you know, we want to parcel out the puff data to the states. We don't necessarily want to parcel out the um, historical table to data to the states because sometimes the concepts won't be perfectly aligned between the two IRS data sources. Uh, sometimes it won't actually be possible to get there from the puff data. So this has two reports, which we're not going to look at. One compares the historical table two to the national data. The other one compares each state, um, each variable in a way that allows you to see if that variable might be hard to hit. And maybe I'll just quickly give an example of that. So it's ht2targetanalysis.txt. And that's this file. And what you're going to see, if you look, is most state, most states, their um, their historical table two values for variables are pretty close to the number of returns they have. But it's not always true. So in the case where it's not always true, is this especially the all other group? So, so we've got the 50 states individually, and the all other group is going to be Puerto Rico, District of Columbia, and maybe a few um, uh, territories of possessions. And this is kind of astounding, but in this lowest income range under a dollar, um, uh, this other, this very small other area has 5.8% of the returns, but it has almost 19% of the wages. That's not something. I've done or we've done, that's simply in the IRS data. So it's kind of important to be aware of that. Um, and, and I'll just leave it at that and go back to the um, program. So those reports that provide some insight. Um, and then the key thing we do, we're now into step four. So let's just go back to the presentation briefly. And uh, so we went through preparing the national data file. Um, kind of talked about the state data file and looked at it. So then there is the last step before we actually do the state um, targeting, I got to get through this in a few minutes, is to prepare the national data. And this is kind of inspired by uh, something that the Tax Policy Center wrote about in one of their papers. And um, the idea is that um, it might make things a lot easier if what you did is you first established weights for every state in isolation, not worrying about this problem of making them add up to the nation, then get the sum of those 50 state weights or 51, then compare that to the weights you had on the file, and then maybe reweight those summed across states' weights um, in a way that gets you right back and hits your national targets. So, so the, the theory of that is that these new national weights, which still hit the national targets, even though they're different than the ones we, we had before, ought to be pretty easy to parcel out to the states. So that's what this step does. I don't know that we have, let me just kind of quickly look at it in the, um, um, in the program. I don't know that it's it's wise to to work through all of that now because we want to leave time for this, um, but I've done that. Okay, and there is a report. Um, it's called. Uh, it, it's I don't know. It's another. It, there's another report that examines 
make sure after we did all of that, that we still hit the national targets and we do. So I'll just leave it at that. And now we're ready to uh, talk about um, the states. And I think we should first talk about methods for a few minutes and then, um, um, and, and then actually do it. All right. So the goal is again, weights for each record for each state that sum to the record's national weight and produce state totals consistent with state targets, meaning uh, the targets we constructed from the historical table to data. And basically loop through the income stubs, solve for the state weights, save the results, assemble a full set of state weights from the results, and then examine the quality. So let's just talk about methods um briefly the first is a disclaimer uh you know i uh, i uh, know about optimization mostly from reading and doing it and uh you know one course in my life so there's a lot i don't know i'm sure if some you know first year phd student in optimization ends up watching this video on youtube they'll probably laugh at, at what i don't know but i try to learn what is relevant for this project uh, and then we'll talk about goals and approaches and, and some details. So the goals, in my mind, were first, correctness. You want to make sure you get the right answer. Uh, second, and it's really important, is robustness. The problem rarely fails when it, if, it's, if it's solvable. Uh, it ideally works without fiddling with options. Uh, you should just be able to set it and forget it. And you should want suboptimal results to be good results rather than total failures or incorrect results. And for example, I used some SciPy routines that when they fail, they, they fail very you know, gracelessly and um, leave you with something that's just kind of in tatters. So, so, so these were the goals to try to avoid that kind of situation and make it fast, that's obviously important and make it you know moderate in its memory usage so um you know there's more than three ways to do this but here are three basic approaches um and one is the brute force which peter and metz and i started out with about a year ago um and the idea is just a straightforward constrained optimization you choose weights that hit targets while minimizing differences for example from naive state weights so you pick state weights that don't move too far from for example the average weight in a state um uh and the problem size can get pretty big. Even if you're dealing with one income stub at a time, the largest is about 40,000 records. So 40,000 records by 50 states means you need to solve for 2 million weights. I'm, I'm moving across the right here. Uh, and you're gonna have about uh, 41,000 constraints. You need to, every, every record has to have a constraint, meaning the weights have to add up to the, to the total. And then you have, um, if you have got 20 targets a state, you've got another thousand constraints for the targets. Uh, it's straightforward. It imposes no functional form on the weights. It is compute intensive. You might say, well, why should you penalize differences from the average weight for a state? Isn't that what this is all about? And, and, you know, uh, I think that's a fair criticism. Uh, there aren't any papers exactly on point. I don't know if I can move what's blocked. Yeah, I can. All right, I, I can see now. There's a paper by Tanton in the bibliography. That's a useful survey worth looking at. Um, the model approach, which is what I'm using uh, in this project, is really inspired very much by a paper by Tat Trukun um, and, and and colleagues, uh, uh, they did it for the Tax Policy Center. There's substantial differences between what they did and I'm doing here, but you know the idea is let's build a model to forecast those weights. We'll estimate the parameters of those model that uh, of that model, and then we'll use the parameters in the model to predict the state weights. That's the basic idea. Um, the problem size is considerably smaller. You know, you got 50 states and 20 targets. It's going to give you a thousand parameters essentially in the model instead of two point uh, instead of two million in the uh, example above. Um, however, it's it's really quite complex, uh, in which creates its own challenges. Um, uh, you know, of course, you could ask whether you like the model itself. Is, is that really the right functional form? And beyond that, um, there are lots of uh, numerical challenges, um, but I think they're pretty solvable. A third approach is to say, start with some na naive set of weights and just solve iteratively. Find the best weights for a state, kind of like what I talked about before. 
and, and do it for every state and try not to change too much from the prior set of weights you had and then pro rata adjust them because when you do it that way, they aren't going to add to national weights and just repeat and repeat and repeat until ideally, if you're lucky, it's kind of converged and, and, and looks good. Uh, it's very low um, memory requirements, very uh, eh, probably not substantial numerical issues. Um, um, and uh, the folks who wrote the paper about this, Randrian Solo, uh, were kind enough to send me R code. I translated it to Python. I made some changes. I have done it. It, it was the basis for what um, uh, Matt and I did uh, for the selected set of states earlier. It can work, but I think that the model approach is probably better. And we are, let me just check on time. We're okay. So the microwave it does have all three approaches in it and many variants on each uh, you might ask why on earth would you have so many methods and so many variants on each method and, and and the basic answer is everything seems to fail at some point or another and having alternative approaches is nice so everything works in the laboratory the made up data you can check the implementation to make sure it's correct you can check the speed and see what kinds of things um are fast and what aren't, what use a lot of memory and what don't, but they don't really, you know, kind of at least I, you'd have to make far more complex problems than I make for testing purposes to really get at the robustness questions. And real data throw curveballs. Uh, uh, some uh, Jacobians uh, uh, cannot be inverted. Uh, I'll explain that later. Or there's lots of numerical difficulties. Some targets uh, are zero, even though the puff data have non-zero values and it's kind of hard to hit them. And some other, there are other kinds of issues like that. So um, nonetheless, uh, based on a lot of testing, I have you know, put a lot of effort into the model approach. Um, again, credit where it's due. Uh, Kit Tatrican and his colleagues uh, writing for the TPC, um, you know, they really you know, kind of laid a lot of this out. Uh, I did make just some different choices. Um, the basic idea is treat the weight for each household and state combination as coming from a Poisson model with uh, uh, the record characteristics as predictors. By record characteristics, I mean, you know, each record has wages, business income, uh, you know, it has uh, uh, deductions for medical expenses, perhaps, and so on. So these become uh, the, the characteristics that need um, uh, coefficients or parameter values. Um, Makes intuitive sense. Poisson models often used for count data. Um, so there's a set of state specific parameters um, for every target. So if you have 50 sets of these parameters, uh, which they call beta, um, you know, you're gonna and, and you have 20 targets, you're gonna have a thousand of those parameters. There's also a fixed effect for each household. Um, and um, they call it delta. And through a substitution, uh, algebraic substitution, they implicitly impose the constraint that record state weights sum to its uh, national weight and that the targets must be hit. So that's the basic idea. Uh, we don't have time to go through uh, the, sim the uh, math, but I hope um, uh, there's two things. So, so A, this is really largely a summary of, of a couple of pages of their papers. So you can read it here, you can read it there. I would point out that you look at one household, W stands for weight for a specific household or a tax record for a specific state. Uh, the essential model is it's raised, uh, it, it is the, uh, the exponent of uh, uh, you know, e to the, e to the uh, power, this power, which includes the beta for each state and the person's data, X is their data, it's a, it's a vector of you know, their business income, their wages, et cetera, and a, a, their fixed effect, which only changes within the households. One thing just to notice is that when you're raising something to, uh, it's an exponent of E, those numbers get big fast. So double precision, um, you know, largest number is 10 to the 308th, roughly. Uh, that's about e to the 709. So this number better not get bigger than that or, or really substantially smaller than that. And there's some work to do to make sure that it's kind of safe. The objective function uh, is either, uh, the, the key thing is to use the betas that you solve for, use that to predict the state weights, calculate the state 
the target values using those weights, compute the difference between the calculated target values and the desired target values. Uh, there'd be you know, roughly a thousand of these differences. Uh, I then convert them into percentage differences, which A gives equal weight to all targets and B is pretty easy to interpret. Uh, and then you have to have an objective function now that you have these differences. One way is to find the roots of this, um, uh, of the kind of a vector valued function, meaning that, that each difference is, is one of the results of the function. So find the roots, or you can construct an objective function that, you know, boils down to a single number like the sum of squared, um, or the square root of the sum of squared, uh, differences. Uh, and then, um, you know, you can solve that with some kind of nonlinear least squares optimization method like uh, this one here, which is, is the kind of the widely known and used one. Um, I've implemented both those results many ways, uh, both those approaches many ways. Uh, we're focusing on Newton's root finding method. Um, you know, basic idea is you gotta, if you're looking for something, you gotta know which direction you're gonna look in and how far you should go before you kind of pick your head up and look around again. And that's a line search approach. Um, there are other approaches, but, but that's, you know, pretty common. Uh, the idea is to look iteratively for the best betas, the best parameters of that um, Poisson function. And, and those are the ones that minimize differences from the targets. Uh, and then in each iteration, you look for better betas, deciding which direction to search relative to where we are now and how to look. Um, key to calculating this step is the Jacobian matrix, which is the matrix of first, uh, you know, order partial derivatives of uh, this vector valued function. So, uh, you know, how much does the change for the target um, uh, for wages in Alaska change when you change, um, the parameter for wages in Alaska, or when you change the parameter for uh, who knows, uh, capital gains in Ohio, right? So um, uh, that is the Jacobian matrix. It's square, it's about a thousand by a thousand, has about a million elements. Um, and in Newton's method, uh, you calculate a step. I, I, I'm just amazed at some of this. So Newton's method, the first variant was published in 1669. Uh, it's just amazing that it's still, you know, it, it is key to many, many um, uh, things we do today. Many, uh, obviously many variants and many, um, you know, improvements or treatments of special uh, cases. Key to computing this step is to take the Jacobian and multiply by the step is going to be equal to the differences from targets evaluated at the base betas, which is of course just a linear system of equa system of linear equations. Uh, and it turns out, while I always just thought about matrix inversion, there are lots of ways you can do this, including some that are far more stable and some that don't even require you to compute. The what you really care about is this product. Ax, the product of the Jacobian and the um, uh, and the unknown step, which is what x is, and it turns out there there are some pretty cool and fast ways to do that. Um, that's the the standard way, but Newton's method works best when you're close to the solution and uh, certain other conditions are met, and so people often damp it because you may not start out close to the solution. And um, so anyway, damping really essentially means just multiplying that step by a factor. Often people choose one between zero and one. I actually, how I look for this damping factor, it's different from what I've seen done, mostly because what I've seen done didn't seem to work, but I run a small optimization within each iteration that looks for the damping factor that gets you the best, um, uh, you know, the best result, the, the smallest errors, um, given a particular step direction. And um, I'm sure there's a reason why it's not being done elsewhere. And probably I didn't implement some of the other methods very well, but this works. So there we are. And um, you do a lot of things to try to make it fast and use little memories, scale the problem, uh, algebraic simplification and manipulation of the objective function to avoid the risk or reduce the risk of overflow. JAX is the auto differentiation um, software. Uh, it has a just-in-time uh, compilation um, 
uh, feature, which I know there's other ways to do that, but, but use that for speed. And when I compute the Jacobian, which I do in one method, use auto differentiation because <laughs> while it's possible to do analytically, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. So um, uh, what else? There turns out there is a whole genre of literature on Jacobian free Newton Krylov methods uh, based on a 1931 paper, here's the title, by Alexei Krylov, uh, who wrote it when he was 68. He was a naval engineer, uh, and it, you know, that was the first cut at, at, at some of these methods of solving for that step within each Newton iteration in a way that is quite robust, uses little memory, and is fast. And SciPy has an implementation of that. Um, within their non-lin program i tried it doing it that way and it, it it unfortunately fails gracelessly sometimes and so what i did was i uh took their code and used it inside of my own iterations rather than using them to run the whole newton loop and uh so that's what i do so i have a set of um so we're running a newton um you know kind of newton's method with a couple of different approaches uh, to solving for that step. Um, you know, the stopping criteria I set are all absolute differences from targets are below, for example, a hundredth of a percent, or we hit some kind of maximum number of iterations or maximum time, or it just stops improving. Um, and you, all of those are adjustable. So now I guess it's time to look at implementation and there there's some other issues but I think we should just get started uh, I think the thing to do is to um, uh, yeah let's, let's just get started um, is, to, is to run the piece of this that is needed so first we define I define a subset of the targets there are 22 of them here I think there are a lot of important ones there's the salt deduction and the number of returns with a salt deduction, this is back in 2017, of course, and some key uh, income variables. You might want more, but that's it. So um, uh, let's see. So we have to head down to the part now where it's, it's called, we're gonna look at a, at, at a step that the ninth income group will solve very easily. So we're going to, uh, just do that and we're gonna define, I mentioned that there's a lot of options. Um, we can let it run for 3000 iterations. We're gonna do, we're gonna try the Krylov approach to uh, finding the step size if that doesn't work or if it, if it stalls, we'll then use Jacobian approach. Um, those are the key things. We're gonna search for the best step between minus one and plus one. That's the multiplier of the Newton step. And that's basically it, unless I did something wrong, it should work. So what we're looking at is some summary information about the problem, 12,000 records, 51 areas, 22 targets per area. It just repeats the options we just looked at. It uses the L2 norm, which is the square root of the sum of squared differences from the targets as kind of its, um, you know, it, it's kind of key um, measure of success and it tries to reduce that to zero, um, essentially by trying to reduce every uh, item to zero. And so we just solved it, and it, we track a variety of other things. How much does the L2 norm change from one iteration to the next? Uh, we'd like those changes to be large negative numbers. Um, what is the maximum absolute error? In other words, if you have a thousand targets, uh, the worst one was 5,520 off from, it's um, uh, uh, from the target at the beginning set of weights generated with an initial totally naive um, uh, beta. I have a root mean square error, um, again, using the percentage values, uh, which tells you something about, you know, kind of how the typical error is. And then it tells you uh, what method is being used, what size the step is, which is typically you want it to be near one, meaning the full Newton step. And, um, but sometimes a better step might be even very small. Uh, and then it just tells you how much time did it take computing the step in seconds? How much time did it take looking for the next step direct? Uh, I'm sorry, how much time did it 
take to compute how far to go in this step's direction and total time and then cumulative time. So that's what it does. And then it tells you how it ended. It took 31 iterations. Uh, the L2 norm was 0.04. Key is the largest absolute percent error was 0 0.01, meaning a hundredth of a percent or something, you know, thereabouts. And the root mean square error was a, a thousandth of a percent. And uh, it took 30 seconds. So um, that's pretty good. Um, to run everything, the trick is to just say use all of the stubs. Um, you know, which would be, uh, I guess, picking in Python lingo, you have to put 11 in there anyway. Um, um, so that's how you do all the stubs. I better finish, you know, get one more minute, I think. Let me just, I, I want to show you something because at least to me, this is kind of a key thing if, if other people are going to use this. If you were to say the only method it can use is the Jacobian method, and then we were to rerun what we just ran, uh, first, I want to show you. We're gonna, what we're going to do here is just monitor. There's a couple things to see. One is um, how much the, each CPU is, U is working. There are 12 threads on this. So, you know, the, right now they're not doing much. And how much memory we're using. We're using 9.6 gigabytes out of you now 64 gigabytes, really. Uh, and so if we are, were to rerun this now, set only the Jacobian, and you watch what's happening to the memory, my cursor here, you'll see that it's in the first iteration, it is building the Jacob up. Ah, let me stop it. Sorry. I want to show you because it becomes real world relevant. We're going to look at the income group that has the largest number of records, so it's going to take the most memory. So if you run this, you will see. Um, on my machine, it's going to take certainly well over 32 gigabytes. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people have maybe 32 instead. So while you can use swap space, that slows things down a lot. So hey, hey Don, can you full size your uh, the resource? Window? Yes, yes, I can. I need to figure out how to do this. All right. So, does that help at all? Can you see where I'm? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, and you can see what's happening to the, uh, you know, this is kind of nice. You kind of like all the processors to be working. So, that's good. So, we'll stop it and uh, I'm all messed up here. But uh, so, let's just repeat this. But now we're going to change it and use purely the Krylov method. All right, and so now we're going to rerun it. And no, I don't want to end everything. So let's just make sure it's caught up with us. It is. No, bear with me. Hopefully, this will. Yeah, all right, so that did it. Let's just, and it did appear to take this. Let's just be sure it's got the right options. And it does. Okay, so. We're going to run it again now with the Krylov method, and we've got to go back to the resources, which is this. And now if you look at the memory, it's using 9.7 gigabytes. It is, I don't quite understand how and why it, it's doing what it does with the processes, but most of the time it's got most of them working, and we're never um, using, you know, memory that might be a strain on a lot of, you know, typical PCs. So. Um, that's the deal there. It is, as you can see, making good progress. It would probably go for a long time. Um, so I think the last thing to do is to get back to the presentation. There's a lot of things we'll need to kind of, I think, step qu quick. Uh, so, so this is, for one version of this, we have 227,000 records spread across 10 AGI ranges um, for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those ranges, we got extremely good results. Uh, and we would probably, this third one that didn't get the maximum absolute error below seven hundredths of a percent, uh, you know, that's probably good enough. But, and, and I would argue that 6% for your worst one isn't so bad. 32% might make you wonder, and we'll come back to that. And then it took, uh, in aggregate, about an hour to run. Um, yeah, so my, I think we need to, if, I'll just take one minute to try to show us sort of a quality uh, control 
report on that. So there is a, let's see, state comparison using the weights that are restricted to add up to the national. So I think that's what we want. And what this shows you is just the percent differences, the, the difference between the calculated sum and the HT2 values, these are numbers you'd find actually in the historical table two spreadsheets, and the percent differences, and then the differences from the targets we constructed, which are sometimes different from what's in the HT2, because we think these are better targets, and then how far we are from them. And you'd like to think that we're, you know, mostly pretty close. You want these numbers to be zero. And they are, for the most part, there are some, you know, uh, so AGI, this is a listing of the 20 worst differences for AGI by state. And you can see that the percent difference from the target is 0. you know, 0.1% typically. So that's really not bad. Net capital gains was a little bit worse. Um, you know, somewhere in here, I, I don't have time to find it, we would find out that that worst one that was off by 32% was the other category. It was salaries and wages, so it's certainly something to be concerned about, but it was it was a pretty small number uh, in an area that we probably don't care about. So I think with that, we should probably um, kind of just, I should, I should stop so we can ask any questions or, or anything of that sort. Um, I would say that, you know, the obvi obvious applications aside from this are to, um, you can spread state weights across sub-state geographic areas such as congressional districts and counties if there are suitable targeting data. And there are data for state tax micro simulation, you could construct data for state tax micro simulation models. So I'll stop there. I have elsewhere in here, you know, there are all sorts of things that could be done to make this better, but I don't think we have time. So. With that, I don't know, questions or? Don, thanks a lot. Yeah, there's been a number of questions in the chat. Um, okay. Try to facilitate this, this a little bit. Um, let me start with uh, Rick Evans. Rick, you had a few questions on kind of the methods and under identification here. Yeah, so my, Don, my main question is you have a certain number of targets and then you have way more filer weights and just fundamentally what that means is there are infinitely many solutions of filer weights that are going to hit those targets so i'm not i'm not surprised that your problem solves because i think there are infinitely many solutions and then um max brought up that there is the penalty and you brought it up in your presentation you do have a a penalty on um, you, you want to penalize terms from changing too much. That, that kind of reduces the under identification problem, but it, it doesn't solve it. And so my question is, in the end, you're hitting the weights like you want to. That's the main goal of this. But um, what those weights are matters to what any policy, the effects of any policy experiments are going to be. So how confident are you in the solution that your um, optimization problem chooses in terms of weights? Sure. Um, so first, of course, those weights actually have a couple of other, um, they have to come from a Poisson model, right? So that is essentially, you know, um, the major constraint. So if you believe that's, if you think of weights as being similar to counts and a Poisson model being pretty good for forecasting counts, um, that seems like a pretty reasonable thing. And of course, they can't be negative too. And you will notice that in fact, if you do this different ways, uh, you know, in all the testing I've done, the weights become highly correlated. It's, it's really something that, that, you know, there's about a 98, 99% correlation if you do it with one method versus another, not just this approach, but, you know, compared to say the brute force approach. Um, that said, I would say that this solves the problem it's trying to solve. And it's not, for example, trying at this point to make sure the household size is correct within age, within uh, income groups. So you gotta worry about that. If you're gonna try to run a policy simulation, um, 
uh, where, where that's, you know, an important variable. Now you can hope and you will often find that these things are highly correlated, but you won't always find that. And what I mean by that is in some cases, it's very clear that the non-targeted variables must be highly correlated with the targeted variables. And so you get good results if you compare the calculated sums for non-targeted variables to what you think they should be. Uh, but there are other cases where that's clearly not the case. Um, you know, heads of household returns are way off, um, as an example. But the question is, of course, how do you make it better? Because either you stop there and say, well, we can't use it, or, or, or you say, well, this is pretty good. And, and, you know, in the scheme of things, you know, we've hit pretty close to 1,000 targets for 10 income you know, ranges or, or you know, in 10,000 different ways, this file is coming pretty close to what we think is true. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I, I like the, I think the Poisson model is, is that a dimension reducing approach? Does that reduce the number of parameters you're choosing? Sure, sure. I, it, think, it, I think those approach, anything you do to reduce the number of parameters you're choosing, get that closer to the number of targets or even mm -hmm. under the number of targets that's, theoretically defensible. I think th that um, makes, I think that alleviates this problem and makes your results even more theoretically defensible. That's right. And, and as I said, there is kind of a brute force approach, which you started to articulate in the beginning, which is there's no model. It's just, let's find a set of weights that, um, uh, is closest to the naive result, right? The naive result being, all right, the typical California record is going to be 9% of the total, for example, right? Um, you know, but that has the, the big disadvantage that uh, there's no reason to think they should be near the average. Um, so uh, anyway, so, so, but I would say, and I, you know, listen, you know, if you had unlimited time, you would test this thing, you'd test one against the other too, and see how much different we, the results are the limited testing I've done was very clear that uh, the brute force approach is very similar in outcome, outcome being measured as correlation of weights under one method versus another, uh, very similar to the um, Poisson approach. But, you know, that's not enough testing to be, you know, to make that a blanket statement. Yeah, I love this work, Don. This is definitely not a criticism of the work, at least not. This is a small improvement that could be uh, at least addressed. I, I love this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And kind of related to those questions, Max had also some other questions or suggestions about using additional data um, to uh, infer the weights. Max? Um, let's see, do I have a question about that? I guess I had one, um, which was, could, could there be a penalty for, and forgive me if I misunderstand, maybe you're doing this already, but to try to get more of those weights towards zero, um, to sort of shrink the final data set size and potentially, um, slightly address Rick's concern. Um, well, of course, the weights are not what they're being solved for, right? The, it's the, the parameters of the model that are being solved for. Um, and if you believe that's a reasonable way to forecast weights, you might want to let it have those weights that are big be big and those that are small be small. Um, is there a way to do it? You probably within, uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't know whether you'd want to drive them to zero. When you solve them for the parameters, I don't know a great way what what you can, and I don't know I, I don't know a great way to do that. I I do think that there that it's important. Something that's not done here is to be able to give different priorities to different targets. If right now, if the um, target for um, number of returns with capital gains in Alabama is off by 20%. That's given as much penalty as the target for salaries and wages in California being off by 20%, which doesn't seem desirable to me. And I don't think it's 
necessarily a hard uh, improvement to to construct priority weights that that allow you to say some things are clearly more important than another. You're left with a judgmental problem of which ones should be most important, and which ones are least. But I think in the example I gave there, you might rather have a model, you know, be sure of getting the California uh, salaries and wages right. But yeah, I think I asked this question before you introduced the Poisson approach. Um, so I guess it cor relates more to the brute force. Um, but a, a version of a brute force where instead of you're trying to minimize distance from the existing weights, you're just trying to basically shrink that norm or something. Yeah, well, there are ways. So, so. Um, you know, uh, I, I messed around with that with uh, Dan uh, Feenberg a, a while ago. Uh, but but that that is um, um, that has its own challenges. You know that's one way, um, and then there are probably ways to um, dampen the importance of outliers within a you know a nonlinear least squares way. But but um, uh, not it's not obvious to me how you do it with respect to weights. You can do it with respect to um, uh, differences from targets where you don't let you know the um uh objective function blow up as much for you know large differences right i guess it was like if you have a record that has a high salt um and it like there's some states where you're just not going to have that because of the way the state state income tax is structured or something um yeah yeah well the code is up there. <laughs> it's uh, th these are you know there's a lot of challenges in this. Um, I would say so. Yeah. yeah, this is amazing work. I want Echo Rick's stuff. I can't wait to use it. Thanks. Thanks. And then Mike had a question in the chat about whether you've had any experts on optimization kind of review these methods and their appropriateness in this context. Uh, well, that's a great question. I mean, obviously, this is uh, the approach largely taken in the um, uh, TPC paper that's in the bibliography and largely, uh, which, which in turn was inspired by those couple of SHRM papers that were mentioned and were used for constructing state estimates. Um, you know, there are reasons why I did not, well, reasons did not do the uh, uh, Joint Committee on Taxation approach. Number one reason is, is they have data that nobody else has, or we don't have. Um, I would love, to have conversations with optimization experts uh, 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 on this, um, you know, there's no question. I think, uh, you know, the Newton method seems entirely appropriate for this. The, the line search I do is different than the line search that's in the literature, in part because I had challenges trying to implement some of those. I'd be shocked to learn that that made a material difference, but um, there are lots of other questions I would ask them because, you know, there's lots to learn. All right, thanks, Don. Any any other questions here for Don? Don, really great work, and thank you for sharing it with us today. Okay, thank you. We appreciate it. Take okay, care. Okay, thanks.